Well, thank you very much for your, for, for your interest in my presentation at this early hour to inaugurate the, the, uh, the sessions of, of talks at this wonderful meeting. So you may be wondering why the music at the beginning, so it, it's not just because Mozart and we are so close to Vienna, so there are other linguistic reasons for that. So if I have time during my presentation, so maybe I'll mention the answers to this question, or perhaps you can a ask me if I fail to, to remember during my, during my talk. So, my talk today is the findings of polyglottery as a science. So, there are many polyglots, language enthusiasts and learners here who have practical learning, language learning experience. So, they know what techniques work for them, so how they learn languages. So once in a while we read or watch videos about other polyglots, other language enthusiasts learning new languages. So, we get something from their experience. But if we try to look at this a little bit scientifically, linguistically, psycholinguistically, are there any uh, general laws or tendencies that, when, that we can discover in the polyglottery as a science? So this is what I would like to present to you. I've gathered some information, some findings, some observations from polyglot experience, published, uh, shared orally, and so on. From my own humble language learning experience, I've put it together. Uh, to give sort of a more or less systematic account of what we can now say on the basis of this experience and this knowledge in terms of ge the general, say, cognitive laws of language learning underlying the processes of language learning. So I'm sure you have something to share on the subject too, so perhaps afterwards, after the presentation, you can correct me perhaps or add something, so you're very welcome. I'm actually interested in learning from you to see how all this correlates with your language learning experience. So what uh, is polyglottery as a science? So f first it was proclaimed that polyglottery is a science at a polyglot and probably the first academic conference whose object was polyglottery, the phenomenon of polyglottery. It was in New York 2013. I'll mention this conference afterwards in more detail. But traditionally throughout history polyglottery language learning Knowing multiple languages have been, has been considered a, an art rather than a science. So an art mastered by few. So just like there are masters in arts, in, uh, in drawing and painting, in dancing, in music and so on, there are masters of language learning. And this is kind of what I regard as a gift, something that cannot be rationally explained. So we just see once in a while people knowing m many languages and that's that's it. That was the perception. But now, with the data accumulated throughout the 20th century in, in psychology, cognitive psychology, psycholinguistics, linguistics, we now have certain scientific basis probably to state that polyglottery can be regarded as a science. So if we look at polyglottery as a science, trying to find the uh, objective laws underlying it, uh, we'll, we'll probably have to say that its object, every science has to have an, ob an object, its object is multilingual knowledge. So how it's attained, how it's learned, how it can be used, what it consists in, what it knows, to, uh, what it means to know multiple languages and so on. It's a research, it's a science, a research field, a research uh, branch based primarily on psycholinguistics. So psycholinguistics being the science of uh, speech as related to the work of, of brain, to the system of language. Speech production, speech perception as correlated with the system of language. Uh, so as I mentioned, the object is multilingual knowledge. And here the main task in these polyglottal scientific research is to understand uh, the cognitive processes uh, that enable polyglots to achieve their outstanding results. So what is it that's operating in polyglot's minds that helps them reach such outstanding, such distinguished results in language learning as compared, say, with people in regular language education. So what's special there? What's going on there that makes them capable of learning, knowing, speaking many languages? So probably it's needless to say this in this audience, but for, for a more general audience we would have to say this, so why pay attention to the polyglots? Obviously we, in any field of uh, activity, we follow the examples of, of the best masters, the best examples. In sports, in, in arts, 
and so on. So we try to imitate, when we learn a certain art or uh, acquire a certain habit, we try to imitate the best examples in that field, the masses. So it would be quite natural for general language education to pay attention to polyglot experience here. So what is the source of information for us then if we want to conduct scientific polyglottal research about polyglottery as a science? So what's the source of information? Initially, historically, the first source was uh, polyglots uh, memories, memoirs, and self-observations made by themselves. So it's books like uh, the books by Katalom, How I Learn Languages, Eric Gunemark, How, uh, the, Art and si the Art and Science of Learning Languages, and others. So something that polyglots realized in themselves and decided to share with the public, to express it in a written form, this is very valuable. But now, uh, so this is the, the first source is the traditional one. The second source is a more recent one, when polyglots became uh, an object of scientific attention, so as an object of study, let's put it so. So th there are now research studies being conducted with polyglots as an object, where their experience, their strategies of language learning, their language behavior, so to put it, uh, are being monitored and documented and analyzed. I'll probably mention one experiment and its results at the end of this talk. So it's actually conducted like any other experimental research. Also, this is why the word experimental in the title of my presentation. So obviously, always language learning is learning any language is an experiment in itself. So it's an empirical, practical experience. We we'll start learning a new thing and we, see, we observe what happens, what is going on during the process and what results we, we get at the end. So before embarking on the main things about polyglottery, its main questions and the possible answers to them, uh, I would like to draw your attention to two metaphors that perhaps can help us uh, view this phenomenon in the right light. So first, again, why polyglot experience? Why study scientifically? Uh, so first, the metaphor of a view of a road from different heights. So if we walk along a, a certain path, uh, we have a road in front of us, and we see it from, from ground, so we only see it well, for, for 10 meters ahead of us, for 100 meters or 10 of us, right? So our sight, our view of this road, of this path is limited. But if we climb a tree, so we have a, a broader view of the area, if we climb a mountain, so we have uh, a clear vision of, of this road, of this path for perhaps kilometers ahead of us. So this is, probably can be applied to languages. When we just know one foreign language, just one language or one foreign language, so our vision of the, of the nature of language learning is quite limited by that. So once we know more languages, multiple languages, we probably start feeling that we have a better understanding of this phenomenon, maybe intuitively first, rationally afterwards, if we rationalize this, if we try to, to think it over. So the more languages we know, the better insights we have into the nature of language learning as a psychological and a biological, largely, process. And the second metaphor is that of different laws in, uh, on different say, levels of uh, reality, if we can put it so. So traditionally we know from Newton's mechanics, well, the, the laws of everyday reality, movements, right, speed, and so on, which can be described by Newton's mechanics quite, quite well. Everything that happens to us just in, on the level of our everyday reality, the objects like us, the size we can perceive, and so on. But once we move into the areas, night, well, 20th century science, 21st century science, like the macro world, the speed of light, uh, the cosmo mechanics or the micro world, quantum mechanics and so on, uh, we find, and well, scientists will tell us, that the language that we use to describe everyday reality actually is not applicable to describe the phenomenon going on there. If we try to use our ordinary language to describe the processes going on there in, on the quantum uh, level, we'll find that it's just irrational. We can say that the same element is here and there in two positions at the same time. So it's, in terms of our language, it's not appropriate to describe it. So if we, if we start doing this, we, we have to admit that it's different law operating on these different levels. So again, probably this can be applied to languages. So if it's just one, the level of our everyday reality, one, uh, our mother tongue, or one foreign language, 
uh, is, is one set of laws going on there, so how we can describe it, understand the processes t uh, taking place in us, with us, with regard to language. If it's multiple languages, we're, in the, we're sort of on a different level. We have, we have a deeper insight into the, na into the underlying nature of language learning, and thus we can observe different laws which are not visible from the point of view of everyday language practice with one or two languages. So these are just preliminary, preliminary notes, remarks. So now the most important thing, so with the gist of polyglottery as a science, as I can sort of put, put it together for now, of course I cannot uh, have everything in one presentation, just too much data, but the key points I'll try to mention. So the main questions, the key questions of polyglottery, so what does it study, what does it pursue to find out, which questions does it uh, pursue to answer? So first, what is a polyglot? What's the criterion here? Is it the number of languages, how many? Although this is the tricky question, I'll, uh, I'll uh, ponder in this a little bit, uh, a little afterwards. So how, how many languages can one physically know? Is there any limit, objectively, biologically, psychologically? A limit to the number of languages we can, that we can actually learn, whatever techniques, whatever strategies we use, whatever gifts for, for, le for language learning we have. So how, what does it actually mean to know a language? When do we count that a certain language is known by a certain person. So how do we know that I know this language, he knows that language? What does it mean? Does it mean to speak it or to read it at what level and so on? So how can this be qualified? Is there any objective criterion or objective criteria for that to describe language knowledge? Again, the object of polyglottery is a science of multilingual knowledge. Is there any objective measure for language expertise, for language knowledge? So obviously the practical questions, how can language uh, languages be learned more efficiently? How can the, they be acquired more efficiently? How are languages naturally assimilated in situations of, of polyglossia? That is when multiple languages are used naturally, simultaneously in, in a certain country, in a certain area, like in India, in many, pa many parts of the world. Actually most of the people in the world are not monolinguals, but multilinguals or bilinguals. So mo monolingualism is, uh, kind of a feature of big countries that's, that's a result of language policy. And in, in the light of all this, how can language knowledge be applied? So if, if we know many languages, so what can we do with those languages, apart from just enjoying learning them and reading literature, perhaps speaking to people? <coughs> are there any socially significant applications uh, for multiple language expertise? And obviously, how can la language education, general mass language education be improved in the light of all this? Because it seems to be not very efficient in most countries of the world. Uh, the only exception being uh, the Central European countries like Germany, Scandinavia, Netherlands, and so on. This is very, very interesting. Most, the rest of the world seems to be quite, well, bad in terms of official language instruction at schools, universities. So Central Europe and Scandinavia is, uh, has an exception, interestingly. So now I'll try to, pr to, to provide some possible answers from, from what we know from polyglot experience, from observations, what can be said about this objectively. So about the first question, probably uh, many people being interested in this and are always asking polyglots about the number of languages they know. So what is a polyglot? If we ask different people, and actually it's been written in those memories of polyglots, all, they all have different uh, ideas of what it would, what, well, what would count for a person to, to be regarded as a polyglot. So Gunnar Mark says you have to know at least some languages to be counted as a polyglot. Spivak says, or oh, no, anyone who just starts learning any other languages is already polyglot, and so on. There are very different uh, ideas in that. No uh, uh, congruence in this, uh, in this question. And probably if we try to see it objectively, we'll have to say that it's more a question of, it's, it's more of a psychological thing than about the number of languages that one has to know. Especially we being probably unable now to say objectively what it means to know a language, to set one objective criterion for that. So still if we had to stick to a certain number of languages, the only objectively based number is number six. So why six? Because the 
number of languages spoken and assimilated naturally in situations of polyglossia, once, as I mentioned, when many lang several languages are used in a certain area, in a certain country, naturally, without people learning them, studying them consciously at school or wherever. Well, some, like in India, so people would speak the language of their village, of their state, then hint in English and perhaps some other language. So these situations of po natural polyglossia, they don't exceed five languages. So there's no place in the world where people naturally, without studying languages, naturally speak more than five languages. So five languages is kind of the, the natural border. So we, if we regard polyglottery as a certain accomplishment, so probably have to add at least one language to that. So number six would be the only objectively based criterion here. But still, I, I think, and from all these polyglot observations, we can still judge probably that it's more of a psychological thing than uh, a thing related to the number of languages. It's more about the attitude to languages than about the number of languages. So probably a polyglot is someone whose lifestyle, whose form of self-fulfillment, of personal fulfillment is learning languages. It's people who can't stop learning languages, who can't just not learn languages. It's part of their life. And interestingly, many and probably even mostly polyglots and language enthusiasts, they are not linguists by training, by profession. They're not working with uh, well, language or language education and language research profession. They have all kinds of different professions and la just languages is part of their lifestyles. It's their interests, it's their hobby, maybe probably more than that. But we should probably describe it in these terms. Yeah. So how many languages can one know? That's another interesting question. If we try to find an answer to, these, to this question in our body, in our brain, we actually can't find any reasons for, to say there are any limitations to the number of languages one can learn. So if we measure the, uh, the volume of memory or something like that, there, there's no indication that there is any limit to the number of languages a person can learn. No, there's nothing indicating to us that, it's, uh, that our capabilities here are limited. The only physical limitation is just the, li uh, the, the lifetime, the time of our life. It's just language learning takes time and it's impossible. And with the, uh, with the number of years we have for, for, for our life, it's just impossible to learn all the 6,000 languages of the world and not even probably uh, a, a tenth of it. So that's the only physical restriction here. But, interesting, so from experimental observations, from interviewing polyglots, it's been observed <coughs> by Gunnemark, by Spivak, <coughs> initially, uh, that all those polyglots, they say they cannot, they do not speak, or they, know, don't, they do, not, do not know fluently, say, so to say, completely, uh, more than seven languages actually more precisely from five to nine languages, but on average, seven languages. So people can know dozens of languages, but that would be to, still to a different extent. They, they all would say that they know approximately seven languages fluently, deeply, and completely. Other languages they would be able to converse, to understand, to read, to do something with them, but on a different level. So the so-called law of seven was formulated. So why this law of seven? So again, this has been drawn, this conclusion has been drawn from empirical data, from uh, practical experience. How can we explain this? So probably a hint that can lead us to a certain explanation of this phenomenon is the so-called law, uh, uh, Miller's law, the law of seven, the magical number seven plus minus two, formulated by George Miller, Princeton professor of psychology in 1956, uh, who he wasn't speaking about languages, so it's just an extension of this law to languages. But he observed in his article, which is one of the most cited articles in psychology, that uh, our working memory can keep no more than seven elements at the same time. So plus minus two, so from five to, from five to nine, on average, uh, seven elements. So if, if you ask, if you so show numbers to a person, or show letters to a person, or words to a person, then you ask him to repeat what he has remembered. An average, on average, people would, would remember seven objects, seven elements. 
So from, for, from five to ma nine maximum was on average seven. So we still, there's no kind of complete explanation of, of this phenomenon. Why is it so? So why is it just se seven units that our working memory can, can maintain at the same time? But if we extend this law to languages, then it seems to correlate with this observed phenomenon uh, of the law of the seven. If we consider languages as kind of units of information uh, that our working memory has to keep simultaneously, then it kind of starts to make sense in the light of the, of the Miller's law. But this still needs further explanation and, and deeper insight. So that's an interesting direction for research. Now, so the more practical qu questions, how, language, how are languages learned and how in this light can this process be made more efficient? So the nature of language learning as such. We're not speaking about individual techniques, individual strategies of particular polyglots, but rather about, uh, again, the general observations that we can make generalizing particular experience of certain polyglots. Now, the main law, the so-called main law, in inverted commas, we can put it so, seems to be that the level of language, of knowing a language, is directly proportional to the amount of input, or in different words, to the number of texts processed by our brain. Well, texts here understood generally, more broadly, text meaning oral texts, video texts, video recordings, uh, audio recordings, written texts, printed texts, conversations, any language material, right? To the amount of language material, to the models of speech our brain has processed. So actually, it can be counted in the number of words. It, there's been an observation that one needs uh, to read about one million words to, to acquire enough vocabulary for a functional command of a language. It doesn't mean new words, obviously. There are, no, there are not so many words in, in any language. But of, of course, repeated words, just reading text, amounting, uh, numbering some, something about one million words. We have just to process it through our brain, so the brain, the brain can crystallize and generalize from this, it can crystallize from this, the repeated words, the repeated models of expression, language, grammatical structures, uh, patterns of speech, and then use it functionally. Also, there's a formula of language learning, initially proposed by Catalom in her famous book, How I Learn Languages, but I sort of adjust this formula a little bit in the light of the main law. So she says that, well, the formula of, of language learning, that the success, the amount of success in, language, in learning a certain language is uh, the level of motivation or interest, kind of being enthusiastic about your language learning, divided by the level of discomfort, so the fear, the negative emotions that you feel about this language or about the situation, the classroom, the process of language learning, your language teacher, and so on. So this kind of correlation results in, in your, uh, well, the level of your success with the, lear with the uh, process of uh, learning a certain language. But I will slightly adjust this formula in the light of the main law, saying that it's uh, not just motivation divided by discomfort, but motivation multiplied by the number of texts. You can be very enthusiastic, but if you have only three words uh, as, a, as a sample of a language you want to learn, you cannot actually learn much from that. You need a lot of language material to process, so, to assimilate the language. Also, from, again, from practical experience, uh, certain principles of accelerated language learning have been formulated. The, it's all expressed in, in the written form. There are articles on that, so if you want some details on any things that I mention now, so I can give you links and uh, directions with regard to particular publications where you can find this. So the principles of accelerated language learning, well, actually, the number is something like five. One, the first one being the natural principle, actually meaning that we have to learn languages in a way that is natural, brain-compatible, natural for our brain. So not going against it, but... Uh, along the natural path of our brain work. So the main thing here being that listening should come first. Not reading or something else, but listen first, then speaking, then reading and writing. This is the natural sequence of activities. And there should be a lot of audio inputs, a lot of listening input. Actually, ears, this is crucial, this is very important. That's actually a topic for a, for a whole different talk, for a whole different research. The, the, uh, the role of uh, hearing and listening in, in language learning, this is actually primary. And parallel text, positive emotions, self-sufficiency of textbooks, and so on. This is all 
about the principles of accelerated language learning. But that's again, that's a different topic. I, I'm afraid I can't stop on this now. It's been observed that there are two main, that we can single out two main stages in learning a certain language. So we can roughly call them perhaps uh, assimilation and practice. So assimilation is, start, is learning a language from scratch to a uh, what is has been traditionally called intermediate level. So A2, B1 border in according to the European framework scale of uh, language uh, knowledge. So it means assimilating the basic structures of, of speech, catering for the major needs of communication. So when we learn, we, when we actually assimilate the structures for uh, expressing desires, negation, uh, will, hesitation, and so on, different, uh, it's actually well, probably numbering to several dozen uh, several dozens of those expression in any language, and it takes several months. So this uh, this stage t s takes several months, and then after this practice begins, when we, we when we actually learn our synonymical ways of expression to the things we actually already know, we know how to say I want, but we learn I would like to, could you possibly, and and so on. Different nuances of style, register, emotion, uh, evaluation, and so on. So this is the, the uh, stage of practice, which is actually mostly about expanding our vocabulary. And interestingly, uh, there is a change in the say speed of language acquisition uh, once these stages kind of switch. When you once you switch from one stage to the next one, uh, so and this is can be called so to say the logarithmic character, logarithmicity, because in the Kind of geometrically, it's, it can be expressed in the form of uh, logarithmic progression. So uh, w initially, when you just start learning a language, you can learn a lot in a relatively short time. So you, you just learn by hours. Every hour, every day, you just learn. You feel that you, uh, you incorporate, that you learn, you internalize a lot of those language structures. But once you cross the, the border of those two stages, uh, it becomes more difficult. So every new bit of kind of language knowledge takes more time and more effort than it did in the previous stage. So it slows down. So kind of you see. So the vertical axis here is the level of language knowledge, and the horizontal one time. So with time, it slows down. So to get higher, you have to to put more, to put in more effort. Also. So the so-called hierarchy of learning materials or the autodidactic pyramid has been formulated, has been observed uh, from practical experience of language learning. That video is on the top of this pyramid, then go audio recordings, and then finally printed text. So it means that video provides us most information because we not only see the words, but we have the intonation, pronunciation, visual context, gestures, and so on. So audio input still gives us, gives, gives us a loss, both the, the language itself as speech and also pronunciation, intonation, prosody, and so on. But in the printed text, we only see this, basically the, the, just the, the, the sentences. We, we had, we don't have access to the uh, other aspects of language. So it's very important to have enough video and audio input when learning a language, not only uh, restrict yourself to, to printed text. So how long does it take uh, language learning? Here are some observations that can be made with regard to this. This is experimental. So 100 hours, there's been an experiment with Alexander Arguelles. Uh, I, I don't have time to explain this experiment right now, but I can just tell it to you afterwards or give you a, a link to the article where this is explained. Uh, from which experience has been observed that 100, 100 hours of everyday systematic study with a spe special re reviewing structure is enough to attain a functional command in the language. So functional command is again uh, A to B1 border, something around, uh, around that. So it's actually experimentally been proved. It's printed in uh, psycholinguistic journals and academic articles. It's been proved, experimentally shown, demonstrated that 100 hours is enough. Of course, it doesn't make you uh, a simultaneous interpreter in that language, but functional command with regard to needs of, of communication to be able to speak, understand, read and write more or less in, in general situations, it's enough. On the other hand, the other extreme of this uh, time investment, time range, uh, span is 
10,000 hours. That's something that's been formulated by Alexander Arguelles in his paper in, in this journal, the, the, the Proceedings of the 2013, probably first academic conference on polyglottery in New York, where he read the keynote speech. Uh, he says you have to put in something about one, uh, 10,000 hours into learning multiple languages to reach this level of polyglottery. So that's his, uh, his observation. And it, it would be interesting to compare this, to contrast this with the natural, say, need for 20,000 hours. That's the, the amount of time that a baby listens from his birth to his mother tongue around him before he can actually speak and use this language. So it takes, so I think I've recounted this in, in, in terms of years, and in terms of years is about two years, or a year and a half perhaps, when a baby starts speaking language. Because he listens to that language, hears it every day, non-stop, for 20,000 hours, day after day, month after month. But, good for us, with adults, this number of hours can be significantly reduced by dozens because of different uh, structures of uh, thinking operating in an adult mind after the puberty period, after the, uh, well, after we switched to the teenage period. Probably starting from the age of 13, it's different uh, processes actually, even biochemically operating in our whole body and mind. <laughs> which make, a, <clears throat> make it possible for us to learn new things and languages much faster than it takes uh, so with a baby. So this is just, uh, I'm, I'm probably I, I don't have time to, to stop on that, to explain to you the details of that conference. Uh, so because this is kind of our more of a social gathering. That was uh, not the conference of, so mu of polyglots so much as of a conference of linguists studying polyglottery as, a, as an academic, as a scientific, psychological, psycholinguistic phenomenon. It's very interesting. Uh, so there's proceedings uh, printed, so if, if you want to get a copy of it, I'll tell you uh, who, who to ask. I just have one with me to, to show to anyone interested. Just three observations from the uh, sort of decisions or observations from that conference, that, or statements made by that conference four years ago. So first, it's been observed that there is just counterproductive ju juxtaposition between practical language learners, practical language expertise, foreign language expertise with modern languages, and academic linguistics on the other hand. Unfortunately, even this rivalry is present in academia in the form of different departments and so on. So there's different attitudes, sometimes negative ones. It's, say, official academic linguists sometimes don't really know foreign languages strangely enough. And on the other hand, practical language learners often kind of disregard uh, linguistic theories, which the whole thing seems to be counterproductive because this is just two, two sides of the same uh, coin. It would be only natural that multiple lang practical language knowledge would, would give you material for academic linguistic observations and vice versa. Also, it's been noted that we we'll probably have to shift from the language teaching paradigm to language learning paradigms. All polyglots admit that polyglottery language learning is always an autodidactic enterprise. So you can create conditions for your, for your pupils, for your students to, to learn, like, motivate them, you can consult them, but actually it's the process that takes place in the brain of each individual when he or she incorporates, internalizes the language. So probably we have to stress the role of self-study in language education. And finally, the, the conference, so to say, imposed a ban, proclaimed a ban on the question, how many languages do you know? Probably because all polyglots got fed up with this. Uh, and, but actually, scientifically, it's not very uh, objective and productive because when you say 100 languages or 20 languages, it actually doesn't mean anything because a person would know those languages at different levels and can do different things with those different languages. One, la some languages they can speak, other languages they can read, and so on. So it's more objective, more productive to ask which languages. Not about the number, but the particular languages. So which languages you can speak or read, or how do you learn languages? So these la uh, questions were recommended by the conference as more productive ones. Yeah, I guess that's it uh, for now, something I wanted to share with you. Is there any remarks? Remark for questions, please. So do we need a microphone for that? Probably not. I need to take <coughs> okay. Thank you. It was very interesting. Uh, 
You have said very little about the difference between active and passive. Sorry. 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 Now, okay. You have spoken a lot about uh, competence, but uh, you don't speak much about the difference between passive and active uh, skills. And in my opinion, those are worlds apart. You can be very good at reading a language and uh, you cannot speak it. In my case, I'm Danish. I don't speak Norwegian. I can understand everything they say. I can even write it. But uh, because they have so many dialects and I don't need it, I have not used it ever. Another little thing about that, you have a nice smooth curve about learning. In my opinion, the active learning is much more in stages. Uh, you accumu accumulate things when you learn passively, but you learn by explosions yes. or epiphanies when you, re when, when you learn actively. Uh, yes, indeed. I just didn't have time to mention everything. I completely agree. It's very different things to so know languages passively, actively. And also from those observations, it's been observed that uh, there are two types of polyglots. So speaking polyglots, chattering polyglots, and reading polyglots. For example, Alexander Arguez, besides the fact that he is perfectly fluent in his multiple languages, he's obviously a reading polyglot. He learns languages for reading purposes. He says, my purpose is to read great literature in all those languages. So for other polyglots, especially younger ones like Tim Doner and others on the internet, they're more chattering polyglots. When they start, they start learning languages, they seek for people on the internet to speak to them, to practice oral skills. Indeed, this is very important. So th probably some classifications of polyglots can be uh, drawn from this. About these st stages of language learning, yes indeed, well I have a marker here. There's also another curve that, that's been observed in the same experiment with, with Alexander Arguelles. It goes something, it goes something uh, like that. It's the stages of uh, emotional stages in language learning. So first, uh, and it's, if, it's, if it takes approximately three months with this, say, intensive language learning to incorporate a new language. So each month is a new emotional stage. The first one is kind of emotional growth resulting in a pinnacle. When you're very enthusiastic, you learn a lot of things, you're very happy about it. Then there is a slowdown and a decrease. And at a certain point, you can be very unhappy. You, can, you, you get even angry with the language. It's been all very ex described in a very detailed way in the research I'm referring to. I can give you links afterwards. I can, I can show it to you. And after, after that, the, the third month, again, there is a raise uh, in, in interest and in motivation Emotion, positive emotions, but uh, a smaller one as compared to the first stage. So it goes in curves like that also, interestingly. Yes, there's another question. Do we need the mic for that? Oh, by the way, just... Uh, you've been talking like maintaining with fluency uh, languages. Uh, the, the, the maximum would be around seven. Um, what is your uh, feeling about people like Catalan, Krebs? Uh, do they really uh, were limited to seven languages fluently, or do they were able to, to speak more than that? And what is your feeling if it, the answer is yes? Is it something different as a process going on in the, in the brain with those people? Yes, I see. Yes, indeed. I think it's, they knew all those multiple languages at different levels. So it's been actually observed from the experience of those polyglots also, from the polyglots of the past. So it can be claimed that they knew well, 50 languages or something like that. So Katalom, she was learning her 18th language, Hebrew, when she died. Uh, so crabs, that's one thing that yes indeed, it's, it's, it's stated that seven languages, it's not the, number, the whole number of languages you can know, but the number of languages you can know completely and fluently. So other languages, you would know them at, uh, at a lower level, basically. So you cannot, physically, it's now stated you cannot know more than 
nine languages, so, so to say, completely. So if, if one says, I know 50 languages perfectly fluently, probably it shouldn't be trusted. So pr probably it, it has to be differentiated here. And also a different observation here, that in the past, the criteria of language knowledge was, were different. So now we're in the oral sort of stage of communication. So to, to know a language largely means to us to be able to speak in this language to many people. In the past, in the 19th century, like with Mezzofanti, for example, uh, the criterion of knowing language was to be able to read and understand the text. He would, per perhaps he was able to converse, to have a small conversation in those multiple languages, but it wasn't com kind of complete language communication, that language. He was just having a small talk with those visitors coming, going through, uh, what was it, Bologna or Florence, I forgot with Mezzofanti. So the criterion was also different. When people in the 19th century, early 20th century said, well, this person knew 70 languages, it can just mean different things by modern standards. By modern standards, it would be, again, passively, they could know maybe 45 languages, but actively they knew, and fluently, they knew maybe five. This is the difference. Yeah. So one last question. The last quick question. So uh, I just wanted to share my own personal experience. You mentioned something about um, how in academia often languages aren't taught very well. And I think it, part of the reason is because languages are very physical. They're less like an academic thing and more like sport or music. You have to achieve like a degree of automation a deg uh, and uh, and I've noticed personally for myself, you know, if I study something so intensely, um, you know, it stays there for a while. But once I stop, it just starts degrading, degrading, especially with the Japanese language. It degrades so fast. Uh, and, uh, yeah. Okay, th that was it. <laughs> just yeah, I agree. So practical language knowledge is a habit, is a skill, just like sports, martial arts, playing musical instruments, dancing. You, you need a lot of repetition to incorporate the, the habits. If we speak about practical language teaching, of course, studying languages academically, language structures, language history, is a completely different thing. Yeah, so we have to close out of this thing. Well, thank you very much for your interest, for your questions. If you have... So if you'd like to continue discussing something personally, I'll be very happy.